It's my great pleasure now to introduce our keynote speaker, the Honorable Roy Romno. Roy was first elected as member of the Saskatchewan Legislature in 1967. Between 1971 and 82, he served as Deputy Premier of Saskatchewan. Throughout those 11 years, Mr. Romano also served as Saskatchewan's Attorney General and was responsible for the introduction of a number of justice system reforms. In 1979, Mr. Romano was appointed Saskatchewan's Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs and he was one of the key players in the federal-provincial negotiations that resulted in the Constitutional Accord and the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms in 1982. As Premier of Saskatchewan from 1991 to 2001, Mr. Romano's government was the first in Canada to balance the budget, reform health care delivery through the introduction of regional health systems, and to enact Canada's first child benefit program, which later resulted in the National Child Benefit. On April 4, 2001, Mr. Romano was appointed by Prime Minister Jean Chrétien to head the Royal Commission on the Future of Health Care in Canada. The Commission's mandate was to recommend policies and measures to ensure the long-term sustainability of a universally accessible, high-quality, publicly administered health care system for all Canadians. The Commission's final report, Building on Values, was released on November 28, 2002. In 2003, Mr. Romano was appointed to the Privy Council of Canada and was named to the Security Intelligence Review Committee and was invested as an Officer of the Order of Canada. He currently holds the position of Senior Fellow in Public Policy at the University of Saskatchewan, but in his capacity as the Chair of the CIW Advisory Board, he'll speak to us here today. He has been spokesperson for the CIW since 2003 and has been instrumental in the success of the initiative to date. It's my great delight to have him here with us today, given everything else that he has to do. Please join me in welcoming the Honourable Roy Romno. I don't know what I can say. <laughs> This up a bit. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Elliott, for your very kind introduction. Uh, I must say, however, having seen the wonderful video by our very distinguished Governor General and past president of this university and the tremendous addresses, I'll acknowledge now Dr. McBoyle, Dr. Dixon, Hugh McKenzie, um, it's uh, reminding me of the time when I first entered political life many, many years ago. Uh, this was in, obviously, Saskatchewan, and in those days we weren't uh, quite politically correct, so you'll forgive me, but it's a true story. It was my second or third public speech, and uh, they had a typical rural Saskatchewan banquet, and the chair got up and he said something like this. Well, folks, we've had a wonderful meeting so far. He said, uh, a great meal cooked by the ladies of Lumsden, as I said, we weren't politically correct, by the ladies of Lumsden constituency, great cooks, great meals. Thanks to you, Charlie, on the old time country fiddle. Because when you get to fiddling, you're the best fiddler around these parts. Good food and good music. Now that all the good things are over, here's our guest speaker, <laughs> Roy Romano. I, I feel a little bit like that uh, right now. But nonetheless, uh, the show must go on, and even if you hear it again, a good story re it deserves a lot of repetition. I want to say that I'm very, very pleased uh, to be here at Waterloo. I think the last time that I stood here in this podium was actually, Susan, when I was the Royal Commissioner. At some point or other, although it was a blur of public speech making uh, about the report, uh, but I do remember the, the, the presence on Waterloo, a truly uh, very special and important university. Uh, in Canada and internationally. So it's uh, all the better to be here uh, with uh, so many of you. I do want to say one other small little additional thanks in addition to those who have spoken, and that is a thanks to Ms. Linda McKessick, who comes from the Atkinson Charitable Foundation and who is now with uh, the University of Waterloo. And I can tell you, uh, quietly working in the background, uh, she's been of enormous uh, help, not only to me, but to the project. Thanks very much, Linda. Well, it's a great pleasure to be with you today uh, to mark this important occasion, the inauguration. Uh, this is a great university, and uh, I say so with no pain at all in my heart, even though I come from the University of Saskatchewan. It is a great university with a demonstrated commitment uh, to progressive research. And the fact that the Governor General of Canada 
and the immediate past president is able, was able, to join us by video underscores the national importance of this occasion and what this university is undertaking. The national importance. Friends, they say that success has many parents and I just simply want to allude and thank some of those parents in making this day possible. First, the important role played by the Atkinson Charitable Foundation as identified. Uh, Hugh McKenzie was instrumental in the idea and promoting the CIW, I won't repeat it. But like every good parent, uh, ACF nurtured us, supported us during our developmental years, provided us with opportunities of growth, and gave, even gave us a very, very generous allowance. And when it was time for us to move to this university, like every good parent, they wished us well, and even in the case of you, showed up here today on our first day just to make sure that uh, I didn't misspeak myself too badly <laughs> uh, in this exciting new phase. As uh, has been alluded, and I think this is also special mention, uh, we have a Funders Alliance and many other supporters. But special thanks to the members of the Alliance, the Lawson Foundation, RBC Foundation, J.M. McConnell Family Foundation, the Province of Ontario, and the Canadian Council on Learning. Now, I should hasten to add here that the Funders Alliance is by no means closed, friends. <laughs> so if any of you would like to be a part of this groundbreaking initiative and you have money, uh, I was going to say at the end of April, maybe before the end of April, we'd be more than happy to make you a part of the Funders Alliance. Again, I want to repeat my special thanks to the Dean and to Brian, the new director of the CIW, for taking on this daunting task, but I think very rewarding task. Brian, I know because uh, you will know this, some of you, maybe some of you won't, has already been involved heavily with the CIW. He co-wrote our report on the leisure and culture component, one of the eight domains which has been alluded to already. So I can't think of a better place for the CIW to be than right here on this campus and with a faculty of applied health sciences. A faculty with its focus on quality of life through the lifespan, understanding the importance of action at the individual, community and population levels, understands the premium on interdisciplinary teaching and research, faculty and its recognition that focuses on upstream solutions addressing the causes as being more sensible rather than the long run expensive attempts to mitigate damage thereafter. A faculty which has the awareness that knowledge for its own sake is good and understanding that knowledge that changes the world is even better. So the Faculty of Applied Health and Sciences here at this university contributes much to this project. And again, I don't want to belabor the importance of Waterloo, but this is the most desirable home I can think of for the Canadian Index of Well-Being. This university enjoys a global reputation for advancing, advancing, pushing the frontiers of knowledge. Its contributions have spanned the spectrum from microscopic uh, topics like nanotechnology and quantum computing. Please don't anybody ask me what those are to be explained and what they mean. To the macroscopic, like the great issues surrounding the future of the universe. What more needs to be said than to have a visionary university with these ideas and count Stephen Hawking as a distinguished research chair with Bill Gates citing this as a top source of Microsoft student and grad hires that has been ranked as the best overall comprehensive university in Canada and also the most innovative, innovative university in Canada. And I checked this to be absolutely certain, the Vice President assures me, for 19 straight years and counting. And whose research has led to the founding of more than 250 companies in the tech sector. 19 straight years and counting. I was saying to the Vice President, maybe it would have been better to have won it on one or two years uh, because at some point, I hope it doesn't come to an end, but it might come to an end. It really makes a tougher explanation after 19 or 20, 21 years. <laughs> but nonetheless, this is a great record of which all Canadians are very proud, and I'm sure you are too as members of this community. Well, that tradition continues, I would argue, with the CIW network. 
and the signature project, the Index of Well-Being. We bring together under one umbrella, has been, as has been explained, the leading Canadian and international researchers and practitioners on this topic. We take an interdisciplinary and intergenerational approach that connects the dots among all the factors that shape our well-being, social, health, environmental, and economic. The focus will also be on policy solutions that will improve the quality of life for Canadians. And we have links with many other organizations that are striving to improve quality of life at the neighborhood, community, municipal, provincial, and regional levels. I'd even say international. I'll say a word about that in a moment. In the tradition of the University of Waterloo, therefore, the CIW, I would argue, is also pushing the boundaries of human knowledge. The work involves nothing short of creating a new paradigm, a new way of looking at how society measures progress, of what really matters, a new approach that expands the universe of well-being and goes far beyond the limited realm of economic consumption. We shall work in the future with a number of countries talking about the international dimension through the development and involvement with the OECD. It was my pleasure to be uh, speaking at the OECD a few years ago in Istanbul, 1,400 delegates, and uh, thanks to the CIW, I was a plenary speaker with uh, Angel Guria, the Secretary General, and they were actually very impressed that unlike other countries who were attending that conference, the OECD, many of which were uh, represented by people who received governmental backing, what really impressed this organization at the time I was there is the fact that ours comes basically from people working in civil society, non-governmental, researchers and concerned citizens. It may be a new model there too, although we need to maintain the international connections. The collective international efforts are beginning now, I think, to bear fruit. We saw good evidence of this when uh, French President Nicolas Sarkozy commissioned the Stiglitz Commission uh, to recommend more balanced and comprehensive ways of measuring well-being. The Stiglitz report saw the President Sarkozy promise to champion a revolutionary new approach to quality of life issues, and if he fulfills his word, and it's our job in a small way, ours as citizens of the world, to make sure that he does, It'll be one that puts them on equal footing with national income and will be a major shift on the international and with a big impact here at home. Now some may be wondering why Canada and the world needs a new paradigm for tracking progress. Well the answer is because the old paradigm isn't working. For too many years Canada, like most other countries, has lacked a single reliable and statistically valid way of tracking its progress as a society and the quality of life for its people. Over the past 80 years or so, something called the GDP, gross domestic product, has emerged as kind of a surrogate, a surrogate for societal well-being. I know, I've used this myself when I was in political life. 